next up, excited to uh, welcome Phil Kesslin, who's a co-founder and CTO of Niantic, which many of you will know is the maker of Pokemon Go, which uh, I don't know what number is accurate, but fastest company to make over six hundred million you, dollars man. in revenue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> and before that, he, uh, he co-founded Keyhole, which uh, became Google Earth. So it's been in the geospace for a long time. So I very excited to career. welcome you. <clears throat> so the company Niantic was founded on this principle of trying to motivate people to get outside, get a little exercise, and do it in a meaningful way with other people. Um, every single application that we built to date is designed around those three basic tenets. Um, we also really take heart in the impact that we have on the individuals who play our games. Uh, in this particular instance, there's a woman named Amy whose son um, was a two-time cancer survivor. And she wrote this letter to the company um, describing how this had a pretty significant impact on her child. Um, personal experience, a really good friend of my wife's has a son who is severely autistic. And the game Pokemon Go was the first thing in his entire life. And he's a 16-year-old child actually motivated him to get out of the house and interact with other people. Before that, he would have to wear headphones to isolate noise and interactions with other people, and that game is the thing that really turned his life around. And she used to cry to my wife all the time about that impact. Um, we, also have a <clears throat> we also have a desire to impact community. Uh, we've partnered with the Knight Foundation in the United States, um, who has introduced us to a couple of other organizations, the National Parks Foundation, and uh, Via Calle San Jose, the Via Calle San Jose activity was uh, activity in the city of San Jose drew about 130,000 people. Um, and through that partnership, about 35,000 of them were actively playing Pokemon Go. Um, closer to the UK, we partnered with the Big Heritage Foundation, uh, which does an annual activity. Um, and in July, I believe last year, in Chester, UK, they did a, an activity that involved uh, Pokemon Go. Um, ended up drawing about 60,000 people, I believe. Um, so quite a few. Um, we've also partnered, uh, we also take great pride in the earth. Um, John and uh, uh, is, is really uh, big into uh, saving the ocean. Um, and so part of Earth Day, we partnered with, um, oh, I can't remember the name now, but we, we collected literally tons of trash from beaches throughout the United States. Um, knowing that we don't, have a lock on the best ways to utilize or to get people outside, uh, we are building a platform um, that will allow people to do that in concert with us. Um, a little bit of history, um, Nathan pointed some of this out. We started um, as a small company in 2001 uh, as Keyhole. We built an application that was Earth Viewer in 2004. That company was acquired by Google um, and that product turned into what is now today Google Earth. Um, and through the activities of that team, uh, built probably the most comprehensive map on the planet. Um, in 2011, we formed a group inside of Google called uh, Niantic. Uh, and the first product that we built was um, a product called Field Trip, which was a f our first exploration into how you could use augmented reality to sort of supplement the information you can get about the world. Um, it provides sometimes quirky information about the world. Um, but we used what we learned from that to feed into our product called Ingress, which is a worldwide MMO, um, a space sci-fi kind of activity where you have two different factions that are trying to take over the planet. Um, we took what we learned from Ingress, we fed it into Pokemon Go. Uh, Pokemon Go was the first, um, first game and even application to reach uh, $1 billion in revenue. Um, it has uh, hundreds of millions of downloads and it's um, uh, probably the statistic that we're most uh, proud of is that um, our users collectively while playing the game have walked 20 billion kilometers, um, which is actually almost three times back. It's to and from Pluto once plus one more trip out, um, <clears throat> which actually I, I, I thought of another statistic today. It's the equivalent of the Earth orbit around the sun for 21 years. So it's, it's quite, a, quite a big distance, and that, that happened over the course of two years. And we're going to take everything that we learned from Pokemon Go, and we're going to put it into Harry Potter, Wizard Unite. Um, everything that we've learned, um, we're feeding back into our platform. Um, we want to leverage the successes that we've learned in all, these, all of these products and feed it into not only the products that we build in the future, but also the products that we've uh, currently produced. 
Um, this is an example, uh, a general overview of what our platform consists of. It's a lot of pieces. Um, and I'll go through just a couple of them. Uh, the, the key component, component that's existed for pretty much the, the entire outset is the core engine, uh, which includes in-app purchase, uh, some machine learning stuff to do behavioral analytics so that we can solve the anti-cheat and security problem. Um, this particular subsystem is the thing that survived the launch of Pokemon Go. It has proven that it can support um, one million simultaneous operations per second, about seven million simultaneous users, and hundreds of active users around the world. Um, the next thing that we're pretty proud of is over the course of five years, we built a database of the most interesting places on the planet. Uh, we use that as the seed for interesting, great places to play and explore. Um, Pokestops come from that. Um, the ingress portals come from that. The, the key feature of this database was that it was it's designed, it was c collected by users, and now it's curated by users. And we will use that when we build the AR component of our system. Um, which consists of a client component to do um, shared visualization, which I'll show in a little bit. Um, we're also building an AR cloud, which that work is ongoing. I'll talk about that a little bit. And we will leverage our users to collect all the data necessary to build that map of the world. Um, so we see our world as a game board. We also see the way we interact with our world and the way our players interact with the world as a flywheel, and that our players provide Incredible pressure on us to build systems that can scale. Um, that feeds into our games, and then that subsequently feeds into our platform. That platform grows over time. Um, we will use the data that gets collected to improve the experience for not just one, but all of our games. So I'll move on to the AR portion of it. Um, so what are we building? <clears throat> we're, we're busy building the tech necessary to make these experiences that much more compelling so that we can motivate people to go outside. Um, and we believe that augmented reality is, is, it lies at the heart of all of that. And we think there are three pieces necessary to make that possible. One, is you've got to create a map of the world. It's got to be the most comprehensive, three-dimensional map, um, highly accurate, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, it'll be curated by our users, collected by our users, and dynamic, dynamic and playable. So in this particular case, you have a fountain, it has a ball on it, how do you make it a little more enjoyable for people. Um, Michael Jones is the one who did this. He likes faces on spheres. That's what he sees every time he sees a sphere. Um, and so this sphere may talk to you and tell you that your friend left you an astrolabe. Um, those are the kinds of things people can put things into this world and make it persistent and leverage it for other people. The next thing you need to do is you have to understand the world around you. Um, right now, most machines are blind to what's in the world. It has no semantic meaning. So we need to build systems that can understand some of that. We're doing some of that, and I'll talk about it a little bit more. But to help us with the spatial understanding, we acquired a company called Matrix Mill, um, which is a spin out of University College London, led by Gabe Brasto, who um, Nathan talked about, um, we acquired earlier. Um, they are the seed of our London office, uh, which now has four people in it. Um, and I'll talk about what they're doing. And the last piece is sharing reality. Uh, this, particular, this particular movie or video is, is representative of the kinds of things we want to create. Just imagine that this person doesn't really exist in the real world, but it's something that people can share and talk about. And it's that shared experience that gives them, the, that, that is the conversation starter that really creates those meaningful social interactions. So what does it mean to map reality? So we've been building maps for a while. Um, you know, it, the kind of map that we're going to build is not going to be the kind of map that we'll need in the future. The map in the future is going to be a, a uh, useful map of parks, sidewalks, not streets, um, places where people interact, not sit in a car and drive around, um, or use for utilitarian purposes. So we want to create a three-dimensional version of that, of the entire world, accurate to at least the centimeter, um, so that we can get um, a high degree of localization. <clears throat> Some of the challenges, eh, centimeter accuracy. It's, that's going to be difficult given that we're collecting all of this data from users' telephones. It's going to change dynamic. The world changes dynamically. It's not a static place. And we're ha we're, we ha we're, our goal is to build worldwide scalable experiences. And 
that that in and of itself is challenging. I know when we launched Pokemon Go, I think every single person on that team, there were four server engineers on a team, their hair was on fire pretty much for six weeks. Um, how we get there, we build a reconstruction of the entire planet through the data that we collect. Um, from that, we enable high precision localization, and then we'll add dynamic adaptation to that system as well. And the team, last year, end of last year, we acquired a company called Escher Reality, which is helping us do just that. Um, our goal is that not, not to build a, uh, a data set or a cloud just for AR, but we believe it will be useful for lots of other things, especially if it's that accurate. So the next piece is adding meaning to the world. It's like, how do you understand reality? Remember that augmented reality consists of two pieces, an augmentation piece, but that's dependent upon reality. Um, advanced augmentation really goes beyond appearance and really has to ascribe some meaning to the things that are being observed. And in order to do that efficiently on telephones or even um, in large-scale computer systems, they're going to require deep learning, neural networks, and artificial intelligence. So for example, what is the vocabulary of AR? If we want to say, put the flowers on a table and a Pikachu in a chair, we have to know what's a chair and what's the table. And the larger the vocabulary you have, the, the richer the experiences you can create. And so if you can segment the world on a pixel level basis and understand that these things are those, the, understand the, not just the object that's in the room, but the orientation and the position, then you can put objects into those situations. And so some of the things we've been working on are um, just some semantic engines that we're trying to get to work on the telephone. Um, so the, there's an activity-based one in the lower left-hand corner, um, which is identifying the baseball pitch, the upper one, identifying the speeding race car from video, and then the last one is, is identifying components in the scene that are not just in the foreground. And the reason, and I'll, I'll talk about why that's important for us in a minute. And our goal is to get this operating, like I said, on the cell phone. And this is our experiments in actually doing that. We've been working with the TensorFlow team at Google, at TensorFlow Lite, to actually get this working. Um, and you can notice the things in this particular scene, the video sequence that are being identified, cars, different types of vegetation. But the reason we think that's important to us is that we want to be able to classify something as a flower bed or a pond so we can put things in it. So put bees above the flowers, or let's put ducks on the water. And, let's, and the, the, the great thing about this is now that they are in this particular space, users can interact with them. The next piece is spatial understanding. Again, this is the work that Matrix Mill did. And in this particular case, we have, we have an expertly choreographed Pikachu uh, based upon this video footage. Um, the goal here was to composite it into the scene. And in this one, you can see the, the uh, problem with Pikachu. He has no sense of depth when he's being integrated into this scene. I'll let him run around for a little bit. <clears throat> so the image on the right is the same sequence, but we've, we've added the depth information. And you can immediately see, while it's not perfect, um, Pikachu is actually, <coughs> actually understands the space much better. Um, he, gets, he gets occluded when he goes behind the flower pots and runs behind people. Now, this was all solved using a neural net uh, running over the video sequence. And then the output of that was run through a compositor to actually put the Pikachu into the scene. So the neural net that Matrix Mill built um, from their mono depth work um, simply looks at the image in the frame, classifies this, the pieces in it, and says, well, there's an individual in that scene, a person in that scene that's 80 pixels tall, well, that must be 6.3 meters away. And it's an oversimplification. But um, what they did was they, they, they took the classical, they, they determined that the classical learning model wouldn't work for their purposes. And in this case, they took, um, they, 
when you're, you need depth, you need the depth image to train the system, but accumulating the depth data is really bad, is, is really difficult. Um, so in this particular case, they've got a LIDAR image. Notice the bus is missing, you know, it's moving, it's a reflective surface. Um, actually, the vehicle in this scene was actually added by students um, because it was moving at the time. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to do that. What, what the Matrix Mill team did was they, um, they capture stereoscopic images and they run that through their their neural network, their training system. And they end up with a solution that provides depth based upon what it sees. So this is just a standard monocular camera using the neural net to extract depth. And here you see the warm colors are the elements closest to the eye, the cool colors are furthest. So given that depth map, we're able to do this. So same Pikachu, except this time he has a friend. <laughs> so what's, what's great about this from a game maker's perspective is that you can create really magical experiences using something as simple as that. And while it's not perfect, as a game maker you can actually use those imperfections to your advantage or you can work around them. Um, like I said, the goal is to, is to get people to go outside more. <laughs> And if they have these kinds of rich experiences, these magical moments, then it gets them to do that. And the last piece is uh, how do you share those experiences with other people? Um, today, when you try to build these things, you, you have a large number of pieces that you have to fit together as a developer. Um, you know, from advanced machine learning and computer vision algorithms to tracking algorithms to networking code to the various platform intricacies, um, which are different between Android and iOS. You have cloud infrastructure that you have to deploy your solution on, and you have to have a 3D engine that you have to integrate it with. Um, our goal was to make it easy. You just write your code on top of the platform, and it runs everywhere. And to test that, we actually built an application. We called it Neon. Um, the, the goal was to experiment with shared a shared augmented reality space using this underlying technology. It's incredibly low latency. It offers dynamic traffic tracking, and it is cross-platform out of the box. I'll go ahead and play hey, this. This is David from Niantic, and this is Codename Neon. So that, that game, um, it's almost like a mini game. Um, the, the key feature of that was it was written in two days to that level of polish, two days. Um, and actually there were several prototypes experimenting with different flavors of what this game should look like. There was a, a game where they had people in trucks uh, running around shooting what looked like little Nerf balls at each other, but we didn't feel like it had enough of the um, movement element. You really didn't have to move around. You could just sit there and shoot Nerf bullets at people. Um, but we really wanted to force people to move around. So one thing that um, it may have been hard to see is that the ground is littered with these spots and you run over these spots, collect them, and that becomes your ammunition to shoot at other people. And so that's what's making people move in that space. Um, I mean, I played it a couple of times. Um, it's a, an incredible amount of, of fun. Uh, we don't have any of the occlusion stuff in there that Matrix Mill could provide, so I was able to actually hide behind that pillar that's uh, that was shown in there and completely they lost track of me. So that was actually kind of fun. Um, but it's, it's through the lens tracking, it was actually very efficient and it uses a shared networking stack that's uh, essentially a peer-to-peer -peer network 
that's really efficient. The, the goal was to get latencies down to less than 10 milliseconds so that you could actually get a really visceral um, type of interaction there. And this is just the first cut. Um, so we've only been playing with this stuff for about two weeks now. Um, and the, the stuff that these guys are going to create is going to be absolutely amazing. Um, the key there is that they've, they've, been, they've been experimenting with it, trying to see what they could do with it. And I think the, the output is going to be really phenomenal um, once we get it more broadly distributed. So Pokemon Go with these types of shared interactions only enhance the shared experience, which is really what we're after. So that's what I've got to talk about. Any questions? <clears throat> Do you have a few questions for Phil? At what point do you think, sort of in the coming years, five years, does it go from sort of a data platform problem to a human interface problem? And like, what, what are some of the things that you see um, coming up or ideas around what you're working on already in those fields? For the human interface? Um, I think it's, I, the difficulty right now is we don't know what this feature is going to look like. So um, just dealing with the, the interaction problem that you have with a cell phone is, is problem enough. Um, we are looking at headset technology and how you could interact with those, but we haven't really gotten very far in that. Um, it's getting this type of stuff working kind of occupies the whole of the organization. So I don't think we've spent a whole lot of time thinking about that, but as our team grows, it'll give us more opportunities to really think along those lines. Hey, Jonathan from Fidelity here. I'm just curious, how much of the, the, the platform you do there is something you, you should do, the app developer, versus what Apple or Android are doing? I mean, the shared stuff looks a bit like what they've got in ARKit V2. You know, to get this out there in the wild, you kind of need to work with the platforms. Where, well, we are working with in? the platforms. Yeah. Um, the, the underpinnings, we, we didn't add any, we don't have our own tracking technology. We're leveraging what ARCore and ARKit provide to do the actual um, understanding of the scene. What we added to it was additional um, map layers and the uh, networking interface to actually make that shared processing a reality. Um, but our goal, we, we recognize that um, the platform providers are going to be able to build more efficient solutions, energy efficient solutions, because they have access to the platforms where we don't. And so we're going to leverage whatever they provide um, to whatever extent we can um, in order to create the experiences that we want to create. Yeah, right here. Hi. Um, I'm Julian from uh, Benevolent AI. Oh, sure. Um, I wanted to have your, your from the human-computer interaction perspective, you kind of touched touch on it in the previous uh, answer, but how do you feel that uh, mobile phones, as opposed to something like Google Glasses, can lend itself to augmented reality? Uh, well, I think, I think the future is in, in a, an un, a unobtrusive experience. So. The glasses are the thing that's going to make this thing really snap. Um, but that's not going to happen for five to seven years if we're lucky. Um, there's some pretty interesting physical challenges that have to be s solved, um, plus physics challenges, um, making this work outside. Um, we're going to, since our, you know, the meat of what we do is trying to motivate people to get outside. It just really doesn't make sense to create experiences that don't get people to do that. I mean, we'll create experiences that work inside, but getting them outside is really a goal. Um, but I, th I think it'll happen, it's just going to take a while. Hi, yeah. I'm Arthur from Deepfinity. So I love what you're doing. You're basically, uh, if I understood correctly, creating a centimeter layer level map of the world. So like yes. Google Earth on steroids, basically. Yep. So how are you actually achieving it? So when people play the game, are you actively recording the environment and then getting the people out of it? Or do they have to like consciously go out and They're start They're going to consciously do it. Okay. Everything that we do is going to be on a level. I don't want to go out and collect data from people that don't know that they're actually collecting it. When we collected the data for the points of interest, we're very upfront. There's a submission process that people go through. So we will be very clear that these are the things that people are having to do. Um, we'll also run algorithms on it to try and remove a lot of the PII information that, that really could get, that, that we, we have to for GDPR purposes. So it's, we're, we're just trying to be really conscientious. It's people's data that we're, we're taking care of and we, we want to be good stewards of that. Hi, I'm Madeline from Imperial College London. You mentioned that one of your challenges was to create this centimeter accurate space. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering why you 
go to that degree of accuracy and whether or not there is a significant benefit from going to down to the centimeter as opposed to um two people standing next to each other looking over each other's shoulders you want them to see the same thing through the device um that's the reason for the the accuracy um it's just how do you get a shared experience that's really compelling for people and anytime you get a disjoint thing if they're standing in two different locations it's a very different thing but you want you want people interacting with the world to see the same thing just as they would in the real world. Um, and that's, that's really a challenge. So we're going to shoot for the moon and go for centimeter.